This is a Poke Press Special Report. Hi, I'm Stephen Reich here at the Poke Press PR and Studios in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm on the phone with John Siegler, who has a long history of being involved with the music of the Pokemon franchise. Uh, goes all the way back to the original theme. So, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you get involved into music? Well, I, I mean, I've always, I've always been a musician. I started playing cello when I was in the second grade, and I moved on to uh, learn how to play the guitar and then learn how to play the bass guitar. And uh, actually, um, I'm a bass guitarist by trade, as they say. And uh, I had a whole career as a bassist prior to the time I started uh, working uh, with the Pokemon people. When I was 19 years old, I, I uh, joined a, a band uh, uh, led by a gentleman by the name of Herbie Mann, who was at that time a very well-known jazz flutist. And I toured the world with him. Uh, we went all over Europe and Asia and uh, the Middle East and Mexico and South America. And it was a wonderful experience for me. I was very young. Moving later in, into my career, I played with a number of very successful uh, rock bands. Uh, Todd Lundgren's Utopia, I was a founding member of Todd Lundgren's Utopia. I was a member of the Hall and Oates band for a couple of years. Um, I toured and recorded with Roger Daltrey when, uh, of The Who, the lead singer of The Who, when he was doing a solo project. Um, you know, I had quite a, a successful and uh, I'm proud to say a, a good career as a bassist. As I got older, uh, I became a studio musician in New York. Uh, at that time in the um, uh, 70s and 80s and even into the early 90s, there was a very thriving uh, business where guys like me would go from studio to studio playing on just about anything that, um, you know, television shows, records, commercials, just about anything you could think of. And uh, so I had quite a uh, uh, fruitful career. I played on a lot of records, played with a lot of, you know, uh, stars and stuff like that. So I, I had a, a, a formidable career prior to going into the whole television production side that sort of the whole thing in a nutshell. And and then how did you end up first hearing and getting involved on the uh, the Pokemon uh, franchise? Okay, well what what happened was we had a music company, and I know you've interviewed uh, John Leffler. Uh, John Leffler and I worked together in a music company in Manhattan, and uh, our our primary business was doing uh, music for advertising, and we were very successful. And we wrote and produced that music together. And we had other writers, some of the other writers whose names you probably recognize from the To Be Master uh, album and also uh, from the Pokemon Live uh, CD. Um, what happened was we were very interested in expanding into the television business. And John, who was an extremely important part of this whole thing, uh, was able to, to meet Norman Grossfeld, who was at the time uh, in charge of production at for kids entertainment, uh, and we started working with Norman on some of the earlier uh, TV shows that he had. We did a couple of shows prior to Pokemon. We did a show called WMAC Masters, and we did another show called Mr. Men. And then Norman brought to us Pokemon. And the first thing that we did with Norman, he, he needed a song, so we wrote the song that eventually became, I think we wrote one song prior to that, uh, but then we wrote the song that became the, you know, I guess the best known Pokemon theme song, you know, I want to be the very best, and um, we wrote that song for, at that time, a sales film that would enable Norman and four kids to get Pokemon broadcast by a, uh, an American television station or television network, which eventually became the uh, WB. So we knew Norman. Norman brought this thing to us. And it, it, it's a funny story to me because when he brought Pokemon to us and he, he showed us some literature from Japan, and we didn't really understand what it was. We had no idea. And we just sort of got the gist of what the show was about, and we went ahead and wrote that song. And, and as they say, it's not that the rest is history. It's just it was amazing what happened. 
And one of the early projects you were involved after the, the series had gotten its, uh, its legs and had been around for you know, a year or two is uh, Pokemon Live, which, if people aren't familiar, was a stage show based around the characters from the Pokemon TV show. Um, why don't you explain, first of all, how did that project get started, um, and what was your involvement with it? Okay. Well, uh, Norman and Four Kids decided to do a live theatrical production uh, based on Pokemon, which was not an unusual thing to do at the time, and still isn't for you know major franchises like like Pokemon. So they made that decision, and they decided to work with uh, the Radio City uh, production company. So they decided to do that. At that point, Norman wrote a treatment for a show. And in the treatment, he based the treatment around the songs of To Be a Master. And so he sort of molded a storyline and, and a, a basic overview of what a show can be, interspersing the songs of To Be a Master into uh, this live show. And in addition to that, uh, he needed additional songs, you know, to, to go through his plot points and the things that he needed. So in the treatment, there would just be, and at this point, there'll be a song, and sometimes he, like, for instance, uh, uh, Where the Best of Being the Worst, which was the Team Rocket song, he said, there'll be a, a Team Rocket song here. It'll be called, maybe it'll be called The Best of Being the Worst, as it turns out it was called that. And so he, inter he basically mapped an entire show with, you know, with not every detail, but all sort of based on the songs from To Be a Master with additional songs that he would need to tell the entire story. Uh, so we went into production and started working on that um, idea. And then oh, you had to make changes to some of the songs uh, that were pre-existing, didn't you? What was that like? Um, it was technologically challenging, but it, it was really very satisfying because we had all the original master recordings and multi-tracks for uh, to be a master. So we were able to go into those original computer programs and uh, digitally make key changes, which was the primary thing that we had to do. Uh, for instance, uh, the song The Time Has Come was originally sung by Marty LeBeau, uh, a woman, and that song in the show was sung by Ash, Dominic Nalfi, uh, so there was a, a drastic key change needed there. In fact, I think I went back and re-recorded a number of the instruments on that one because it was such a wide difference in key. Uh, and so the voicings, I didn't like the way some of the voicings sounded and stuff, so I think I redid that. But in a lot of cases, we were actually able to, to digitally transpose uh, into the keys that we needed the songs from the original To Be a Master into the keys that we needed. And most of those songs the form of those songs didn't have to change that much. Maybe we did some editing. To be honest, I can't remember. We probably did some editing based on what was needed for the, for the stage show. Uh, so eventually we were able to create, uh, from the original To Be A Master recordings, those songs and the music tracks for those songs because the uh, all the singing on the show was done live. So it was only the music tracks that were um, pre-recorded. And uh, one other thing is that a couple of these tracks uh, ended up on Totally Pokemon. Now, did they start off being created? For example, there's Pikachu, there's You and Me and Pokemon. Did those songs start off being written for the show and then get ported to that other album? Or Yes. Uh, for example, You and Me and Pokemon on the Totally Pokemon CD is a completely different arrangement musically from the version that was in the show. The version that was in the show, there's two different versions of that song. The version that was in the show was, this, was the version that I originally did that had a very world kind of percussion kind of feeling to it. And it was, it was really the first big production number of the show. And when they brought out all the puppets, they had made, had made these marvelous puppet, puppets of all the Pokemon. And the actors, you know, they were all on sticks and stilts and all kinds of stuff. And so they all came, you know, they presented all the Pokemon during that song. The second version, the version that's on Totally Pokemon, was a completely different arrangement that was done by 
one of the guys in our company uh, and a good buddy of mine, and also a really great bass player, uh, Neil Jason, who did a number of rearrangements of songs that I wrote and did great jobs with them. Uh, he did the rearrangement of uh, You and Me and Pokemon and turned it into kind of like a dance, you know, a, a, a much more up-tempo dance track. He also did an arrangement in the first Pokemon movie, I guess it was the first Pokemon movie, of the original Pokemon theme. That's pretty cool. Now, you also got to, to meet with the, uh, the actual actors who were doing the voices and uh, the, the acting in the, in the show. What was that like? It was great. I, I, I loved working with all of them. What we, what we did was um, I also worked with the director, Louis Perez, on a regular basis. And basically, my day for almost two months was divided between my studio and working with Louie or working on my own, where we would, if Louie, like you and me in Pokemon is a great example, if he would say, look, I need another 48, 64 bars here of music because I'm going to bring out the puppets and they're going to dance around, they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And then so I would add that music and so that he could do that. And then, of course, he would change it. And then I'd have to take some of it out or add some more or whatever. And so I would spend my mornings working either with him or just working alone in my studio on that music. And then in the afternoons, I would go up to the Radio City Rehearsal Studios, which are um, in the same building as the famous Radio City Music Hall, and work with the singers and work with the actors, uh, working on the songs, working on the harmonies, teaching them the songs. And it was a wonderful cast of young um, Broadway aspirants singers and dancers that were terrific and just amazingly talented. And uh, listen, some of those people have become, gone on to be enormously successful. And Andrew Reynolds, he played James. Uh, he's the lead in the Book of Mormon now. He plays the lead character in the Book of Mormon on Broadway now. The guy's enormously talented. And I saw him on TV the other night. I saw him on the, there's an HBO show called Girls. And he played a boyfriend on Girls. You know, uh, Dominic Nolfi, who played Ash, was in Jersey Boys for ages. Uh, I think that, uh, I, he toured with it, and then I think he was on Broadway with it. But, I mean, these people, these kids, they were, to me, they were kids. They were all right out of college, and, but enormously talented and, and uh, energetic and enthusiastic and just wonderful to work with. They were really terrific. It was a great experience working with them. That's great. I mean, it's great that you got to work with them, and it sounds like you had a great time. We did. We had a ball. So you're also currently you're in a in a group, and you've actually just released an album. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your group, um, and and then uh, afterwards you can pick out a couple songs from your new album and tell us about them. Okay. Um, well, I've been doing a lot of stuff since I left Four Kids, but uh, an important part of what I've been doing is working with a band called The Martes. That's M-A-R-T-A-Y-S. And um, we just, like last week, last Wednesday, we had our uh, initial uh, CD release uh, gig and party uh, at the Bitter End in Manhattan. Uh, interesting thing about this, it, it, it's a band of, of good old friends. We've been together for a long time. We've actually had this band going way back uh, eight or ten years ago. We've been playing regularly. But the interesting thing, and we were talking about this before, is that the lead singer of this band uh, is Marty LeBeau. Marty LeBeau is the person that I chose, the woman that I chose to sing The Time Has Come on the original To Be a Master album. And um, we've been friends for forever. I guess it feels like forever anyway. And she's a wonderful, marvelous singer. And um, uh, so we have our band. And... Um, it, it's it's a it's a large band with a four piece horn section and three background singers and two guitar players. It's a thirteen piece band, and uh, we're very excited about it. And we've been having a great time. Why don't you pick out a couple songs from the album that you want to talk about? Okay, we the concept behind the record is the record. I still say record, but the concept behind the CD was to have done interesting and creative. Uh, reimaginings of classic rock songs, some of which are very well known, some of which are not as well known, depending on how old you are. Really, <laughs> what we think of as the single is a rearrangement and a re um, 
uh, imagining of the song uh, Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, uh, which was a big hit for the animals, uh, Eric Burton and the animals back in the 60s. And um, we, we redid that song in a completely different way. And I, I, I think the uh, idea of it uh, was very successful. One, one of the things about this particular band is there's an, uh, almost every member of the band is a pretty, a very accomplished arranger and has been in this business in New York for a long time. So the ideas really flow when we're in rehearsal and when we're creating this music. We did another rearrangement and reimagining of really very famous Bob Dylan song called The Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, which he did, <coughs> excuse me, he did a, a very kind of simple acoustic guitar version of it originally. Uh, we do it as a very <coughs> aggressive blues song, and uh, I thought that came out really great. Um, we do a version of James Taylor's Country Road, uh, where, whereas he did it as sort of a, a gentle folk rock, we do it as a, a slamming, kind of almost gospel version. So uh, there's a lot of interesting music on that record, and there's some really marvelous playing. Uh, I think that one of the things about this record that I'm so proud of and so happy about is that the musicians in the band are of the highest quality in New York that you can be. And uh, I, I say that with humility, but I also am completely serious. Uh, the, the, the guys in this band, the guys who play, uh, the drummer Frank Bellardi and the guitar players, um, Larry Saltzman and Ira Siegel, and the piano player uh, Erwin Fish, uh, who is also the horn arranger, are of just amazing quality. And if you ever look at our press release, uh, you can see all the hundreds of famous people that members of this band have played with. So that's the Marte's. Awesome. Really glad to have you on the program, John. It's been my pleasure. This has been Stephen Reich from the Pokey Press PR and Studios in Madison, Wisconsin, on the phone with John Siegler, who has a, a long storied history with the music of the Pokemon franchise. This has been a Pokey Press special report.